I would be coughing and spitting tissues, you know, all the, all the time. But it has got better. And I'm, you know, that's in a week. I can't wait for six months. How's that going to be? <laughs> Hello. Would you please introduce yourself and yes. where you're from? Um, my name is Barbara Cowan. I'm from the UK, from just outside London. Why are you here with us in Swiss Medical? I came because I needed some stem cell therapy, which I had researched uh, lots of places and decided Belgrade was a two and a half flight, two and a half hour flight away from where I lived, so it became the focus. And I had lots of conversations, lots of interaction with the staff here before I came, including the doctors, and I was satisfied that I could get some, some work done here. So what is your diagnosis you're here with? Um, I was diagnosed in 2016 with interstitial fibrosis of the lungs, something I had never heard of. It's idiopathic, meaning there is no known reason why. However, I could tell you that when I was growing up in the United Kingdom, the state of the air quality was pretty appalling. And I remember going to school on the bus and in fog and smog. And we grew up with this. Throughout my life, for oh, until probably the 80s, you could go to a restaurant, a cinema, fly on an aeroplane where smoking was prevalent. It is still in many parts of the world, very prevalent. But we have more or less eliminated it from our local places in the United Kingdom, thank goodness. Um, but of course, you carry, you know, if you were born in that particular time, you carry the scars with you. And I feel, in my case, my, <coughs> long ago problems, if I did have a, a, a scar, a scar is caught, it's scarring, interstitial fibrosis is scarring of the lungs, it's like a burn and it cuts out part of the lung and it atrophies, it dies. And if you have um, a, a stress or trauma in your life, which happened to me in 2016, I had very, my family were dying. I was re really stressed. And I think it came about then. However, it was many years before it manifested. I was asymptomatic for about um, six years, no symptoms, and then Last, well, it was after the, after the lockdown and the pandemic. It seemed to me, I didn't, not that I got COVID, I didn't. Um, I was well hidden away. But it seemed as though after that time, it came about. So it, and in fact, one of the doctors here was quite surprised that I, for so long, had been without any symptoms that, um, and had no medication. I wasn't on any meds until I came here. So were there any therapies you were undergoing none, back home? None, nothing, nothing. None at all. The only, the only time I had a CT scan and a lung function tests, I had three of those and they were all 100%, except last year's my lung function test went down to 89%. And I, that's when I started to feel ill. Um, I couldn't, you know, I felt very fatigued. I couldn't do very much. I felt tired all the time. And I, I couldn't garden, I couldn't 
hoover my house, uh, you know, all of those jobs that I was always doing myself. And um, I knew that I had to get some kind of help, but it wasn't forthcoming. This is the trouble because it's really, you're left to your own devices. You just have this one uh, uh, test CT scan and a lung function test. And if that's okay, yeah, that's it, you're done. You, you know, but I knew, I could feel that I needed more, but it wasn't available. So I researched, looked for myself. So how did you come up with the idea to try a stem cell therapy? I went online, it was full of resources, that, and I just got on to all the universities, MIT, mostly, mostly in America, because that's where all the, the, the top science is. I came across um, a man called Neil Reardon, who had been doing this for 40 years. He pioneered it. I'm a great believer in pioneering people who are science-driven. Science and uh, but there were many, many very, very good, good people that believed in this. And I, I suppose my philosophy has been healer, heal thyself. And not, I don't want to come across as an alternative practitioner because I do think allopathic medicine has a huge part to play. But having worked for a a surgeon, general surgeon, 30 odd years ago, who was pioneering keyhole surgery, and which was unheard of. But I remember writing his abstract the, for the, um, the uh, conference he was going to attend in, in uh, Australia. And now it's mainstream. Everybody has keyhole, even my sister, four years ago, and this was using keyhole surgery for mesh hernia, using it for the hernia, and even robots, that was verboten then. Oh, it wasn't available, it wasn't the norm. You know, there's a, there's a medical orthodoxy throughout the world, if you like, that, oh no, you don't go there, you know, if it's anything different. Although there are great scientists and in fact, in, in, um, just as an aside, there are a thousand papers on stem cell therapy. One of my doctor friends, he said, he, you know, he knows they're there, but only 24 have any real value. In other words, they're sort of, oh, no, we're not, it's not, we're not with it yet. We're not there yet. But if you think about it, you donate blood, you donate plasma, even the glamour gobulin is donated from patient to patient. Why not the placenta? And, you know, the placenta is, is not used. Why not? It's full, full of all these goodies. And I just, I, I suppose my head did a double take really and I, just research more and more and more. I couldn't get away from it. There were some fantastic lectures that I attended, particularly on MIT, they're, they're, that was so resourceful. And then I got to the clinics in Mexico, because they've been, because of the medical orthodoxy, <clears throat> they're not going to fund it. I got onto the clinics in, that had been driven out mostly by, by Americans, they had to, had to go somewhere else. So that's, that's what I did and looked. And then I found, I found this place. And, and really, it has to be said, I didn't want <clears throat> a 15 hour journey to, uh, to Mexico or Panama, which is where they are, but they are over here. And also, they're opening up in Pakistan, India. Very huge interstitial fibrosis problems in India, and place where there are huge amounts of smokers. Japan have also set up, started. It'll eventually, 
creep out throughout the world. But at the moment, Western, Western people have to find their own way. You know, in, in the clinic here, we've, we've since we've been here, um, had some Aust people from Australia, people, you know, other people from London, from Italy. They, 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 gradually, they've, if, because they're desperate, because they, they're not prepared to say, oh, there's nothing you can do, bye, go and die. No, they're going to fight back and say, there must be a way, and there is a way. So did you have any fears before coming here? No, I didn't, because I, I think the interaction that I had with, and, and the knowledge that I had, I was able to ask the right questions, and the doctors were very forthcoming, very um, keen to assuage my fears, and I thought, no, this is it, I'm going. And <laughs> did I had problems with friends and family, that you know, my sister, oh, what are you doing here? But I was determined. But what was your overall experience here in clinic? Wonderful, wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Not just the medical stuff, or which is superb. I found out things that I didn't know I had, um, because nobody had. You know, nobody tested me for these things. Now I know I can, I can work on it. I can act on it. Um, I didn't know, for example, that I had uh, pulmonary hypertension, the starting of it. But you know, nobody told me that, um, and I haven't had a test for um, ECG or no, I've had an ECG, but the. Um, um, what is it when you have it, your babies? What, what is that ultrasound. one? Ultrasound. Had an ultrasound, and actually, Dr. Anna, who is wonderful, allowed me to look at the screen. She explained everything to me, where this hypertension and the blue light that came. I think we should be told. We're not stupid. We're not silly people that, oh, well, you know, it's only a, a choice for the doctors to interact between themselves. No, the patient needs to know. I want to know. I want to know what I can do to help myself. I got all the... I, I was never a problem. I ask questions all the time, and I think that's the way to go. So how many days have you spent in the clinic? Um, the well, it's a nine-day trip altogether. Well, days one and days nine are traveling days, so I've had seven days of very intense, full-on therapy. Have you already maybe felt some changes during these seven <clears throat> days? Um, well, I, I certainly have. Um, I used to cough and spit the whole time throughout the night, um, first thing in the morning <clears throat> with the... <clears throat> I mean, it's not totally gone. You can hear it in my throat. <clears throat> but I would be coughing and spitting tissues, you know, all the, all the time. But it has got better. It has got better. We're glad to hear. And I'm, oh, you know, that's in a week. I can't wait for six months. How's that going to be? <laughs> Is there any advice for people out there <clears throat> seeking some help being in the same situation? Research, research, research. Really try and work out what your own, um, <clears throat> your own practitioners will tell you. Get as much information as you can. And if you're not satisfied, look elsewhere. Because there are, there's help. There's help if you need it. Just to, you know, just for a, a little while to go. And I was online every day, every day. I would not give it up. So, yeah, that's, you just got to help yourself. <laughs> Thank you so much, Barbara.